this presentation, I'd like to discuss the impossibility of dinosaurs evolving into birds. So the title is Dinos to Birds, Horse Feathers. What is not the case is that the evolutionists do not say that the flying reptiles evolved into birds. So uh, we see this fossil here, and we also see the Indian cave art of these flying reptiles that must have been witnessed sometime after the flood here in the American Southwest. What they do say is that Deinonychus is their most probable candidate to be the type of dinosaur that evolved into birds. So I would like to look at these various lines of evidence to show the impossibility of dinosaurs evolving into birds. So dead dinos do tell tales. Let's take a look at the business of warm-bloodedness versus cold-bloodedness. Mammals and birds are uh, warm-blooded. The better term to use is endothermic, meaning they generate their own heat. Whereas reptiles, fish, and amphibians are cold-blooded, and the better term is ectothermic. They obtain their heat from the environment. Osteons are structures within bone which have these circular patterns, and these are in compact bone, uh, and they are characteristic of large animals because they provide extra strength like reinforcement bar inside of concrete. And so these concentric rings uh, are supposed by evolutionists to be evidence for warm-bloodedness, but we know that's not the case because they are found in tuna, which is definitely not a warm-blooded critter. Also found in other very large uh, animals as well that are not mammals or birds uh, but do have some osteons. Uh, so osteons would not be a line of evidence for uh, warm-bloodedness. Another is the assumed brood behavior of dinosaurs. Okay, so as you know, uh, leg egg laying is how the reptiles uh, reproduce. On a sideline, uh, no one can explain how the laying of eggs in a water environment by amphibians can translate into laying of eggs in a terrestrial environment and then burying them. And then the young, that th after they hatch out of the egg, have to dig themselves out through the sand or dirt to get to the surface. And so there is no brood behavior here, although crocodiles are noted to stay in the vicinity to guard the uh, clutches of eggs. In turtles, the mother lays the eggs, uh, buries them on the beach, and then swims off and does not ever pay any attention to them. So those hatchlings are on their own to make it during that most dangerous time period of getting from the uh, site of the egg uh, hatching to the ocean before some bird uh, claims them as uh, food. Well, the idea of, of this uh, brood behavior comes from a find where layer upon layer of dinosaur eggs of considerable size were found uh, from some type of sauropod uh, dinosaur. And so they assume uh, that there was a return to the same site year after year. Uh, but the thing is, why would those eggs still be there year after year? Why would they not hatch out? And so they take this to say this may represent an established nesting ground looking for this brood behavior, um, but there's no evidence for that. Uh, instead, they were, uh, I think, uh, using the uh, creation flood model that those legs were aid, uh, laid in a panic as the female dinosaurs were trying to escape the floodwaters and under the stress of trying to escape them ended up dumping all their eggs out into one location as the animals were herded together by the waters, tremendous numbers of eggs collected there by multiple uh, females uh, dumping them. Thescalosaurus uh, was said to have had a four-chambered heart. Here is an artist's conception of what the Thescalosaurus may have looked like. And so this uh, fossil find here was purported for a time to be representative of a four-chambered heart and you see uh, H for heart and S for the scapula and uh, HU for the humerus, the upper arm of the bone. And uh, so it was said, uh, this is a four-chambered heart.
But however, when a CT scan was performed on this specimen, they determined that it simply was a collection of mud that uh, hardened and was mineralized into a portion of this uh, fossil here. And so there was no uh, evidence for a four-chambered heart, which would be a sign of warm-bloodedness. Well, looking at the nasal turbinates, you can see here the diagram of uh, human turbinates. In other words, these structures inside of our nose that greatly increase the amount of surface area uh, within the nasal cavity so that the nose can do the job of humidifying the air and using the combination of mucus and hair in the nose to capture particles in the air that are rebreathing in so they do not get to the lung. Also for adding resonance uh, to our voice and um, uh, the sinuses also provide a means of adding resonance and for lightening the weight of the uh, skull as well as the sense of smell in the nose. So 99% of all endotherms, warm-blooded uh, creatures, have these nasal turbinates. And so looking for those, they would say this would be an evidence. But ectotherms have very narrow nasal cavities and they do not have turbinates. And so here you can see CT scans of these various animals and the fossils uh, showing the difference uh, that uh, there are no turbinates in the fossil specimen as compared to the warm-blooded uh, birds and mammals. It's performed on at least uh, four different species of uh, dinosaurs lacked nasal turbinates, so there's no evidence for warm-bloodedness in this line of evidence as well. So let's take a look then at the situation with the lungs, bird lungs, avian lungs, versus reptilian lungs, since dinosaurs are reptiles. So first I want to show you the human lung uh, uh, as an example that uh, our airways, uh, after we get to the trachea, branch and branch and branch until we get to the small little air sacs at the end, we call alveoli, and that's where the gas exchange takes place to get rid of the carbon dioxide and to take in oxygen into our bodies. And these are dead end structures. So it's two-way flow through the uh, air passages to get to the alve alveoli, and then the air proceeds back out through the very same route. This is in contrast to birds, where they have a very different setup with these structures called parabronchi instead of bronchi. And that means that these are alongside each other, and they run in parallel. And so what happens is the area of gas exchange is only in these areas, and it is only one-way flow through these particular areas. So as we look at this diagram here, you can see that air comes in through the trachea, it goes to air sacs, and then uh, flows through the parabronchi where the one-directional flow occurs for the exchange of gases and then goes back out. So I'm going to show you some arrows here to show that through the trachea and then into the air sacs which are kept full of air so that there be continuous pressurization and continuous flow of air through the parabronchi whether or not the bird is breathing in or out. So here is where the gas exchange takes place in the parabronchi and then the, the air goes through the other air sacs present, and then finally out through the trachea. So the reason for this setup is because the work of flight is so demanding that the oxygen needed is great, and there needs to be this continual non-stop supply of oxygen for the work of flight. So as you may be familiar with the sound of these uh, bagpipes, they have that sound called the drone, which is that constant sound, so that even though the, the person playing the bagpipe stops to breathe and uh, has to stop blowing into the instrument, that reservoir of air in the bag is what keeps the sound going nonstop while the person breathes. So that's how the design of these air sacs uh, enable the bird to uh, get adequate oxygen, oxygen to supply what's needed for that tremendous high energy work of flying. And so you see here a diagram showing uh, in yellow the various air sacs that are located in birds uh, doing that work and they even extend into the humerus, the arm bone, so you can see here the cavity where the air sac uh, is located. 
And on a side note, you can see also here this exquisite architecture of the bone itself uh, with the same engineering principles as what we use in bridges uh, for roads and uh, railroads uh, for a minimum amount of material to give the maximum amount of strength. And this also helps uh, lighten the weight of the bird, making it easier to fly. Well, another feature here is the sternum, uh, which is also can be called the keel in this situation, like the keel of a boat. And so the muscles of flight are attached on each side to the sternum so that when the arms are flapped, the muscles are anchored uh, to be able to uh, pull uh, against and uh, retract the wings back down. Uh, so this is an important structure uh, as well that is unique uh, to the bird. In addition, the rib cage is very different in the bird because the ribs are actually jointed much in the way like our fingers are jointed. And this does not occur in reptiles at all. And, and that is so that they can get fullest expansion and fullest contraction of the chest cavity to maximize getting the air in and out. And in addition to that, there are these uh, f uh, extensions of the ribs that cause overlapping of, of that extension from the one rib to the next rib so that the expansion of all the ribs is coordinated uh, so that there is no work of one rib uh, moving in the opposite direction from the other ribs. And then here you see highlighted the joints uh, in the ribs themselves. Well, here is a diagram showing uh, what is the wishful thinking of an evolutionary artist saying that here are air sacs uh, in this uh, dinosaur. Uh, and they say, well, there is this uh, air, oh, air window, air window, that's what pneumatic foramen refers to, so that an air sac could extend uh, through uh, the uh, spine here in the uh, skeleton. Um, but the other reason that we have these uh, types of uh, structures here uh, is to lighten the weight of the bone without diminishing its strength. Uh, and also uh, certain bones will have these types of cavities for producing uh, blood cells in the marrow inside the bones. So this is uh, presumed air sacs, totally wishful thinking here. Let's talk about hips, lizard hips versus bird hips. Okay, the traditional classification used until recently would be lizard-hipped birds, and that's what Sariskian means, lizard hip, literally, as opposed to Ornithischian, meaning bird-hipped dinosaurs. Now, the irony is the, the dinosaurs that have the construction of the bird hip are the ones that walk on all fours, as opposed to the ones that walk on the hind legs only, having the lizard hip structure. And so the difference is the tilt and the angle of the pelvis, so that the ones that are lizard-hipped on the left have the pelvis tilted much more uh, towards the back posteriorly, whereas the bird hips have the pelvis tilted much more towards the front anteriorly. And so this makes a difference in distinguishing the two categories of the dinosaurs. And so you can see here the T. rex has the lizard hip and the other specimen has the bird hip here. So the, tra the tra traditional classification here uh, is given in contrast to this newly proposed classification where they change the relationship of the dinosaur groups to make it look more possible for this to fit the evolutionary scenario. But it's, it's just playing games with diagrams. So when we look at how they walk as a result of how the hips work, it's very interesting to note that dinosaurs, like people, do their walking at the hip as we move the hip joint to move the entire leg. Whereas birds, even though it looks like they're walking the way they do, they actually are not. They're knee walkers uh, because of the femur, the thigh bone, being parallel, nearly parallel to the ground because of that tilt of the pelvis. And the motion of walking is not accomplished by the femur, but is accomplished uh, below the knee. And so what looks like a knee to us is actually the ankle of the bird leg, 
And so they are knee walkers. Uh, I like to be able to make a pun about skywalkers. Uh, but they are knee walkers instead of hip walkers, as are the reptiles and as are we. So again, this is the wrong anatomy. Uh, theropod versus Archaeopteryx teeth. Theropod being the beast-footed dinosaurs, uh, such as a T-Rex, uh, shows that uh, they have teeth with serrations, with these sawtooth patterns here, and they have straight roots for the teeth, whereas Archaeopteryx has non-serrated. They have smooth teeth that are much more constricted uh, and have um, bases and expanded roots so that they're much more of a uh, sharper, narrower angle than the uh, theropod dinosaur. So it's the wrong kind of teeth with the wrong kind of root and base. Types of three-clawed feet are very much in contrast here. The beast-footed dinosaurs have three claws going forward, uh, which are digits one, two, and three, where as opposed in birds that have three claws, their digits are number two, three, and four. So they're very much different. Now there are birds uh, that are different that don't have the three claws going forward, but their arrangement is two forward and two backward as we see in the woodpeckers and in parrots. So that doesn't help the evolutionists at all whatsoever. So the wrong digits uh, comparing the bird and the theropod uh, dinosaurs. What about the origin of feathers? We have here fossilized skin with scales of Triceratops and Hadrosaur, and they have the keratin as their structure, but they do not have anything in common with, uh, with feathers. These scales are totally unfeather-like. And so there was uh, a find called Sinosauropteryx, meaning Chinese lizard wing, in which these structures were purported to be details of feathers. But as it turns out, they were simply uh, protein uh, accumulations that had these designs but had no feather structure at all whatsoever. So these were not examples to be used to promote uh, the evolution of dinosaurs to birds. There was one very famous example called Archaeoraptor leoningensis uh, from this region in China, and Ar Archaeoraptor meaning ancient raptor. And so this was found in China, was obtained by National Geographic at great cost. National Geographic had a panel of experts, uh, including uh, the head of the Royal Terrell Museum in uh, Canada examined this and they declared, yes, this was a valid uh, fossil find with transition with a feathered tail and the body of a dinosaur. So a big splash was made in National Geographic in the magazine on TV and stuff. And they said, okay, we've got a transitional fossil here. But uh, several months later, uh, other evolutionary paleontologists said, can we please take a look at this as well? And they said, yes. And so they carefully examined it and said, you know what, I think we need to do a CT scan of the specimen. So that was performed, and it was revealed that an exquisitely skilled craftsman had taken two different fossil specimens from the same kind of rock and put a bird tail on a body of a dinosaur. And so this was a fraud, and National Geographic uh, had to uh, lose face as well as a lot of money that they lost for this. So this was, uh, again, no evidence for a feathered dinosaur. In this slide we see actual fossilized feathers uh, from the bird, the Confuciornis Sanctus, which means holy Confucius bird, named after the ancient Chinese philosopher. The difficulty for the evolutionists is that this was found in the very same rock layer as dinosaurs from which it is supposed to have evolved from. But from the point of view of Noah's flood, this makes perfect sense. So you see here in this slide that the keratin scales and the keratin protein in the 
Feathers are the same material, but the architecture of the scales and the feathers are very different. In the highest magnification of 20,000 times that you see in the lower right image shows the hook and groove pattern in feathers. How in the world this is going to change from scale to the hook and groove pattern and still have an organism that can survive, that can have protection while losing the scales and still not yet fly until the wings are developed is beyond me because animals like this would not be able to uh, fly yet and they would have great difficulty in obtaining food and protecting themselves. So uh, again, there's no evidence here for the ability to have the change from the scales of a reptile to the feathers of a bird. What about the origin of flight? Evolutionists believe that flying birds evolved before non-flying birds. That theropods evolved into birds, we've already discussed this. That the forelimbs could not reach the mouth, grasp prey, bear weight, or um, even take advantage of the long tail, balancing the weight of the long neck and large head while they're in the process of evolving. And so there's a significant problem here with the modification of function and control of appendages. You know, the focus is always on the physical changes of changing from a forelimb into a wing or from a hind limb into a claw that can perch. But what about the almost never discussed software changes in the brain and the nervous system that have to also happen in order for the new functions to be able to take place? So these legs that were designed for running have to perch and the arms designed for uh, grasping uh, have to fly. So this transition then from Deinonychus to a flying bird is just simply not feasible. And especially paying attention to the idea of perching on a branch because birds are constructed with a different arrangement of the tendons so that when the bird is grasping the limb, its muscle is actually relaxed. So that way the bird can sleep all night and not tire out. So the bird only uses the muscle to either grasp initially, to open up to be able to grasp, or to open up to be able to ungrasp the limbs, uh, the limbs of the tree. And again, this also has to be taken into account in the software changes in the brain. Well, for the origin of flight, they say that at first feathers developed uh, to give warmth, or not to give warmth, but gave warmth, and that those feathers were also useful to catch insects to to try and herd the insects toward the beast's mouth. Then the creature climbed trees to hide, sleep, or nest to have greater security, and then started gliding uh, after it jumped from tree to tree to escape enemies uh, so that it could better escape or feed. And then actual flight supposedly developed. Uh, but this, you know, this, this scenario is just really wishful thinking. There are multiple different types of flight. Uh, here we see uh, mammals, bats, uh, at night uh, flying. Also, we have insects such as this dragonfly with two pairs of wings that operate independently, and the dragonfly is able to move around like a helicopter. It can go forward, backward, sideways, up or down. It's just amazing how it can control the muscles for the two pairs of wings. Butterflies have at least three different patterns of wing motion for flight depending upon wind conditions and what they're trying to do. And then we have um, these uh, other organisms such as the flying uh, squirrels or we should say gliders or sugar gliders and um, they uh, glide uh, climbing up and then uh, floating down and then landing and grabbing onto branches as they go down. Uh, flying fish supposedly, uh, supposedly um, called flying fish, uh, simply uh, glide as well. They swim powerfully up out of the water using their tail muscles to propel themselves and then spread these membranes that stretch um, uh, out uh, from the body uh, and able to be able to glide for considerable dances, distances and then they can slap their tails against the water surface and glide uh, further trying to escape enemies such as sharks who are trying to eat them. And then there are these uh, frogs uh, which uh, will leap from one tree to another 
uh, and then land and grasp the lower uh, tree that they're uh, jumping to. But the most interesting one of all, I think, is uh, one that was captured in a very popular, well-made, uh, famous movie, and that would be the flying monkeys here. So let's take a look at uh, Archaeopteryx and Proto-Avis. Archaeopteryx meaning ancient wing, and according to the evolutionist interpretation of the fossil record, it represents uh, this bird um, at that point in time. It has a real characteristics of an extinct bird, um, not some transition form. It had claws on its wings, but so do uh, birds such as the Watson uh, in uh, South Central America, and also the um, ostrich, as you see in the little red circle, uh, well, the um, arrows here, rather, uh, on the fore uh, part of the wing front surface, there are these little claws there on the young ostriches. Uh, and the Archaeopteryx had teeth, real teeth. Well, there are birds known to have had teeth in the past, such as Hesperornis, the western bird, uh, had teeth as well. Um, and Archaeopteryx also had complete feathers. They are not an um, artifact of the fossilization. <clears throat> and they had all the fine features of feathers uh, in these various uh, specimens that we have uh, uh, from uh, Germany and surrounding territories. They were said to have a weak furcula. The furcula is the wishbone uh, to which muscles of flight attach. And, um, and that was supposed to mean that it was a weak flyer and couldn't fly very well and was in the transition from reptile to bird. But indeed, that's not the case. And so here you see uh, the skeleton uh, with the furcula there uh, up front with this uh, circle around it um, showing its location. Uh, we know it as the wishbone uh, in chicken and turkeys. Well, according to the evolutionists in the fossil record, it appeared 150 million years ago, and so that would place it here in the fossil record. Uh, but then along comes Eo Confuciornis, Confuciornis uh, Zhengi, named after a very respected a Chinese ornithologist. And at this point in time, things still look good because it is dated from 120 to 130 million years ago, according to evolution, after um, Archaeopteryx. So everything is fine so far. Uh, but then there's another fossil problem which shows up, and that's Proto-Avis, uh, found in Texas. And again, according to the evolutionist dating of the fossil, according to the rock layer it's in, uh, it precedes both uh, Archaeopteryx and Eoconfucius ornus uh, Zhengi. So this is a problem, uh, and it's also indicated by its name, first bird. So it predates what's supposed to be a transitional fossil, Archaeopteryx, from reptile to bird, but they're all fully birds. And the latest research, research shows some very interesting things, that there's a, a gradual decline of the dinosaurs with a simultaneous increase in the diversity of birds even before the end of the Cretaceous period. Until now, it was generally assumed that the dinosaurs died out first and bird species diversified afterward, states the researcher. Our data, however, substantiate the theory that birds ascended before dinosaurs became extinct. And then another quotation here is, evolutionists have found fossils of sandpipers, loons, ducks, flamingos, cormorants, and albatross in dinosaur rock layers in the 1998, Dr. Tom Stidham reported in the prestigious science publication Nature that all major modern bird groups may have lived with the dinosaurs based on genetic and fossil evidence. So this certainly shoots down the theory of the dinosaur uh, preceding and evolving into the bird. So what about the actual origin of birds? We see these very beautiful creatures um, it was thought for a long time, or assumed, that this marvelous display of the tail feathers was part of a mating ritual, courting ritual. But indeed, that's not the case at all. As it turns out, further investigation has indicated that other things, such as a, the call of the bird, uh, is used for that purpose. And that's especially good for this particular peacock who has a mutation and loss of information for the color in feathers. And so if his ability to mate were dependent upon the color display, he'd be really out of luck. 
So here in Genesis 121, then God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So here we have the historical account of when and how birds came about. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind and cattle according to its kind and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. So here we have birds preceding the land animals, in other words, the reptiles, the dinosaurs. And so it's a different time order of events with the creation account, uh, historical account in Genesis versus the evolutionary story. And so I'm just showing you here the sequence of events in chapter one of Genesis with the time, space, and matter um, from day one uh, being created, and then the waters above the expanse separated from the waters below the expanse on day two, the expanse being the firmament, being the heavens, which on day four would then be populated by galaxy stars, uh, moons, and uh, planets. Day three, the separation of the waters below the expanse to form the dry land and the seas, uh, also the creation of the first uh, biological life in the form of land plants on day three. And then day four, the sun, moon, and stars created uh, uh, for the sun to rule the uh, day as the greater light and the moon to rule the night as the lesser light and the stars given for seasons. And uh, so we have all of these uh, heavenly bodies put in on the fourth day. Then day five, the sea creatures and the air creatures, and day six, the land animals and man. So again, according to the order of events, birds preceded uh, reptiles and could not have evolved from reptiles. So a little quiz here in review. Dinosaurs could not evolve into birds. And why? Because there's no uh, firm evidence for warm-blooded dinosaurs. Osteons occur in the bones of large mammals, birds, reptiles, and tuna. No evidence for assumed brood behavior of dinosaurs. Their breathing is the wrong kind of air structures, lungs, because they have these parabronchi and instead of the alveoli, the parabronchi in the birds and alveoli in reptiles. Birds have no diaphragm, which mammals and reptiles do have. Instead, they have a, a very different arrangement Rib cage and wrong kind of ribs, the wrong, they're jointed uh, and have the extensions overlapping the following ribs. Uh, so those are there. Walking, the wrong kind of hips, they have the bird hip dinosaur walked on all fours. Also the wrong joint is used to walk because they're hip walker, uh, knee walkers, birds are, rather than hip walkers as in reptiles. The uh, feet are the wrong digits, uh, one, two, and three for the dinosaurs, two, three, and four for the birds, uh, incompatible. Scales don't change into feathers, no evidence or mechanism to change four limbs into wings, and we have to take into account the software, the nervous system, uh, and the control in the software needed to uh, deal with uh, four limbs flying instead of grasping or hind limbs perching instead of running. So Archaeopteryx follows appear, fossils appear after first bird Proto-Avis as a fully formed bird. Proto-Avis was found in same layers as early dinosaurs. Archaeoraptor, the feathered dinosaur, was a fraud. Birds were created by God on day five, dinosaurs on day six. The order of creation of evolution once again are incompatible. Creationists and evolutionists have the same evidence. Interpretation is determined by presuppositions about the God of the Bible. So we have this beautiful uh, montage of these various birds showing the fantastic colors and shapes, uh, tremendously beautiful creatures, not only visually, but in the songs that they sing. Uh, here, these species are all native to uh, central Arizona in the Phoenix area uh, where I live. It's a joy to be able to see these as we look out our windows and go outside uh, when it's not boiling hot. So the names of these, if, uh, for your interest, are the common raven, the white-winged dove, the finna pepla, the curve-billed thrasher, the northern cardinal, and here we have the uh, uh, quail, gambles quail, Harris's hawk, 
the pygmy owl, as well as the broad-billed hummingbird, the Gila woodpecker, the roadrunner, the great horned owl, and the cactus wren. So I thank you for your attention, and I hope this shows you that clearly birds cannot have evolved from dinosaurs. Thank you.